Happy Mother's Day to all of you. You know, as I sought the Lord for a word for today, for the first service, he gave me a word that came from a mother that we needed to listen to and follow her instructions. But for the second service, he didn't give me a word from a mother. <laughs> so all I can say is, David did have a mother who influenced his life. And sometimes when people see us, they don't see the mother who has led us to where we are, who's influenced our lives. My mother has passed away, she's gone. And I know that I know that she influenced my life tremendously. I remember I used to get so angry at mommy sometimes because whenever I had a problem, I knew what her answer was gonna be before I even got done, it was gonna be, well, let us take it to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Let us take it to the, and before she would talk about solving it, let us take it to the Lord in prayer. I mean, couldn't you say something different? But today she is not here, and I know who to go to when I have a problem. I go straight to God and take it to the Lord in prayer. So I thank her for it. And I know that every one of you can give a testimony about how your mom, whether it be a biological mother, or somebody else who has been a mother to you has affected you in your life. And we want to give God a, a round of applause, a thanks for all the mothers in our lives. Our sermon this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's actually taken from the entire chapter. However, we're not going to read the entire chapter, which is 58 verses long. <laughs> but we will read the first 11 verses of that chapter. And then as we continue to walk through, we will see the other verses because they'll become apparent to us. Uh, so 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me hear some amens when we find them. Yeah. Amen. Okay, I'm reading from the New International Version. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokol of Ju in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Demon be between Sokol and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. Yeah. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and, his, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer, excuse me, went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? <laughs> Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day, I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that can fight and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Father, we just thank and praise you for your word because your word is life. It is truth. And God, it restores us, it reverberates us, but it not only does that, but it empowers us 
to walk in your service, walk in your way, walk in your life, to love you, God, and to serve you. And so, God, this morning, as we look into your word, would you apply it to our hearts, to our minds, to our souls, to our spirits? God, we want to be hearers of your word. So we ask that you would anoint each of our ears that we could hear. But we want not just to be hearers, but doers also. So let our lives be changed because you have spoken to our lives and to our spirits this morning. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Trying to find a title for this message. It's called Trial to Triumph. Mm. The path for defeating our giants. <laughs> Every one of us have trials in our lives. Everyone. Yeah. And if you're not going through a trial right now, you wait. Yeah. Coming to Christ doesn't mean the end of trials. It doesn't mean the end of testing. It means that there's someone who's going to walk through your trials with you, who's going to take you through the trials, and on the other side, you can look back and know that you came through because of the blood. So this morning, as we look at trial to triumph, defeating our enemies, we see the Israelites, who were often engaged in battle for, to maintain their freedom, was once again faced with a battle. Battles in those times were high stakes. The nation that lost the war also lost their freedom. <laughs> there was, there were be, to become servitudes to the winner. The loss was a loss of people, a loss of property, a loss of pride, a loss of privilege. During the life of David, many battles had been fought. During the life of Saul, many battles had been fought. And in those days, there were no weapons of mass destruction, I'm telling you. They didn't have airplane bombers. There were no guns. There was armor, not ammunition. There were spears and swords and javelins and the power of the punch. Bulletproof vests of the time consisted of a bronze helmet, a bronze tunic to protect your torso, and a good shield. If you weren't up in your opponent's face, your best shot was going to be fired by your javelin, not a pistol. <laughs> and if you came close to him, then you can use your sword, your spear, or your fist. The battle that we're about to witness today was fought between Israel yeah. and the Philistines. Yeah. We are simply spectators, several thousand years later, looking not only at the battle positions that we just read about, one hill, the other hill, the valley between them, but also at the battle preparation. We're looking not only at the situation, but also the strategies for winning. We're looking not only at the fight, but the fighters. We're looking not only at the winners, but the weapons that were used. Yes. Let's focus in on what we see before us this morning. The Philistines. The Philistines were challenging the Israelites to battle. The Philistines and the Israelites had been in perpetual war. Yeah. They occupied the Canaanite territory before Abraham got there. And initially, they had treaties of peace with him. But sooner or later, they began to engage in battles. And we know that they were in servitude before because back in the book of Judges, they were in servitude. The Israelites had been slaves to the Philistines after the Philistines had been disobedient to God, began to worship the Philistines' gods. The Lord allowed the Philistines to defeat them in battle and made them slaves. So the Israelites knew what to expect. But not only that, the Israelites and the Philistines had fought battles in which the Israelites had won. Yeah. They had experienced victory. Yeah. After Saul was anointed as king by Samuel, Saul's first victory was against the Philistines. The Philistines threatened one region. Saul caused all the men of Israel to gather by scaring them, actually. He cut up some oxen and sent the flesh around the town. And he said, anybody who doesn't join the army, this is what will happen to your oxen. Nobody wanted their monies to be taken away from them, and that's what the oxen meant. 
And therefore they all joined. 330 men joined the Israelite army. And that was the first battle that Saul fought and won. And after that, people didn't have any problems with him becoming king. So Saul had experienced victory. What was the difference here? In fact, Saul was so confident of his victory that he reduced his army size to 3,000 men so he could beat Philistines. He was confident of victory. And here in this scene, we see the Philistines have now entered the Israelites' territory because they're just by Judah here. They're not even in their own land anymore. They come into the Israelites' land, occupy one of their hills that's facing another and is challenging them to war. And the challenge is a little different from how it typically is. Typically, you have one army going against the other army. They're lining up in battle, and then they're all coming down to one point and fighting with one another. However, in those days, there were also part of the rules of engagement also allowed for one man from one army to defeat one man from another army. And if, that, if whoever was defeated, that whole nation would have to surrender because of that one man. So why did the Philistines choose to do this? Because they had among them some of the hugest people of that time. The Anakites, who, as we would remember, when Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land and said, go see what the land has to offer, they came back and they said, oh, there's a whole lot of good stuff in that land, just like God said. But the people, the people are giants. They're so huge, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And the majority of the spies, 10 out of 12, suggested that they don't invade the land because the people were so big. And so now three of the major cities of the Philistines still had these huge Anakite people. And Goliath was one of their hugest. And so he stepped out in front and he said, well, look, we're Philistines. Y'all are Israelites. We're fighting one another. We don't have to have all of us engage in battle. You know, at the end of this battle, there'll only be one person dead, either one of you or one of us. Come out. Come out. And typically, what they would do is they would come out day after day, and they would taunt the enemies. Yeah. And they would seek to irritate them so much that finally they would send somebody, and then the battle will engage, and whoever won, became the leader, and whoever lost became their slave. So here we have this happening. Not one day, not two days, not three days, not four days, 40 days. 40 days. These people have been lining up for battle with Goliath coming out, and as the Bible tells us, they were dismayed, that means they lost hope, and they were scared. Yeah. All of Goliath, not the, end, not the whole army, they were scared of Goliath. Who are the Goliaths in your life that are crippling you right now? And how long have you been watching Goliath on that other hill and don't dare advance to the valley that God is sending you in to fight? What are the Goliaths in your life? They may not be the who's, they may be the what's. But you know this morning we're going to look at, or this afternoon, we're going to look at trial to triumph. We're going to look at defeating the Goliaths, not only in my own life, in your own life, but in the life of your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children, those Goliaths on the, in, in school, that, that's the academic that your kids can't deal with, those are Goliaths that we need to defeat. Those Goliaths that are the bullies on the playground, those Goliaths that are bosses who oppress you, those Goliaths that are causing you to not move forward with whatever it is God has told you to move forward with, those are the ones we're looking at this morning. We're looking at the path 
for defeating the Goliaths in our lives. And so the Lord is so neat. He sets it up for us. He tells us what's happening with these two armies and the battle lines and the fear that is crippling his people from trusting his word and going out to fight. And the Bible tells us that David, the son of Jesse, yeah. still a boy, yeah. less than 20 years old. Sometimes we talk about our teenagers, but God used a teenager in this situation, one of the young people, still a boy. Jesse, his father, had eight sons, seven of them older than David. David was the youngest. David was a shepherd. And he was out tending flock. Yeah. He had been in, the, in Saul's court also serving Saul, but as a musician. Saul used to be tormented by some wicked spirit, and David would play the harp, and the beauty of the music would calm Saul's spirit. And so that's how Saul served David. Saul was, I mean, that's how, sorry, David served Saul. David was not huge like his brothers, big and built in stature, like the three older brothers who were serving in the army for years. He was a smaller boy. And why am I saying all this? Because we're setting the stage for what David is about to do and looking at who David is and how David took on Goliath. Yeah. So Jesse says to David, your three oldest brothers are in the army. They've been dealing with this thing for quite a while, about 40 days. I know they're probably low on supplies here. Take these 10 loaves of bread and take it to them. And also take some cheese and carry it for their commander and come back and tell me how they're doing. Because I, I want to know. I want to know if they're still alive. I, I need to know how they're doing. So David sets out on his journey. And the Bible tells us that he left early in the morning to set out on a journey. Left the shepherds that he was taking care of in the hands of one of the hired help shepherds because he was his daddy's manager of the sheep, but there were other shepherds who worked for them, so he knew he could leave them in the hands of responsible people and head out as his dad has, had asked him to go and take bread for his big brothers. That, that's really what he was. He was a messenger taking bread for his big brothers and some cheese to make sure that the commander treats them right. So as far as he was concerned, that was his mission. That was the mission his earthly father had given him. And David gets there and David discovers when he gets there that he's there right in time to see the men lining up. They're just coming out of camp and lining up. And so he can't get to see his brothers because they're no longer in the camp, they're in the battle line. And David wants to go see them because part of what you had to do to assure the father that the boys are all right, he asked him to bring back a pledge. In those days, what you did is you brought back a little piece of the person's hair or a little piece of their clothes. So you, it wasn't just your word. I, you can bring back a piece of my hair and say, here, this is Angela's hair. She's, I'm telling you, she's still alive. So he needed to physically be in contact with his brothers. Yeah. So here he doesn't stay in the camp. He leaves the food there and he goes to where they are so he can obey his dad and get a pledge to come back. And while he's there, he sees this huge giant coming out front and saying the things that we just heard him say. Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Paul? Choose a man, have him come down here to me. And if I overcome him, you'll be my slaves. And if you overcome him, overcome me, then we'll be your slaves. Come on, y'all. Come on. Can't you fight? And David is looking at this and going, whoa. <laughs> Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that challenges my God? How dare he? Now, now remember he's the smallest among the group, the youngest among the group, the least experienced and the most incensed. Everybody else is afraid and has lost hope. Mm -hmm. 
and they are experienced. They have beaten the Philistines before. And David is standing there and he's like, I cannot believe this is happening. I mean, what's the king saying about this? So our first point for trial to triumph and defeating the giants is recognizing God's voice. David felt he was sent there on a mission to bring bread, but he quickly recognized that it was more than just to bring bread. He heard the voice of God. He realized that all these people here had been there for 40 days and they were doing nothing to defend the name of his God. And so he became incensed and he began to question. So first of all, you gotta be in the right place at the right time. The place that God sends you is where you need to go. David could have said, I am a shepherd, I need to be taking care of sheep. I don't need to be sent to the, to the uh, finish line, to the battle line. Won't you send one of your other servants, Dad, so that I can stay and take care of the sheep? No! David was obedient, and because of it, he was in the right place at the right time. Another aspect of recognizing God's voice is recognizing that God must be glorified in everything and at all times. David understood that what this Philistine was doing was taking glory from his God. That's why he was so incensed. He didn't see him as challenging the Israelites. He saw him as challenging God. The Goliaths in your life aren't challenging you. They are challenging God. If you believe in God, if you trust in God, if you're a child of God, that Goliath is challenging God. Stop making it seem as though it's your battle, because it's not. It's the Lord's. <laughs> thing that David did in his recognition of God's voice and path at this point is he surveyed what was going on. He didn't just jump to conclusions. He began to walk around and ask questions. What's going on here? How long has it been going on? What's the king doing? What's the king saying? What are, you what are your strategies going to be? We, we, we jump to conclusions and try to run and fix things too quickly, y'all. We need to look and listen and ask and question and figure out what is going on so that God could lead us to what we need to be doing specifically yeah. and precisely. Yeah. And then yeah. the other aspect of recognizing his voice is stepping up to the task. David stood, stepped up to the task. Now stepping up to the task is not an easy thing. We are always going to have naysayers along the way. Yes. Can anybody identify? Yes. There will be naysayers who will tell you what you could do and can't do, what could be done and can't be done, how it needs to be done and how it shouldn't be done, whether you are the person to do it or whether it's somebody else. So how did David deal with naysayers in this situation? Well, his first naysayer was his oldest brother. His oldest brother, the Bible tells us, questioned him. He said, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at David. And he asked, why have you come down here? Yeah. And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? Well, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You just came down here to watch the battle, didn't you? The man who was David's brother questioned David about his responsibility or the lack thereof. Why are you here? Shouldn't you be doing something else? Isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? How come you, how, why are you here? Who, who's the sheep with? Are you, have you left them on their own? What are you doing here? You shouldn't be at the battle lines here. A lot of times when we seek to move forward where God has sent us, people are going to ask, why are you here? What are you doing here? How come you're not over there? You are not supposed to be doing this. Come on now, you're a woman, you shouldn't be preaching. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I've heard that. Come on. 
I've heard that. And there's all kinds of objections that we experience about why we are where we are. But if you are where God wants you to be, it doesn't matter who that naysayer is or what they're saying, you know you're in the right place, stay there. And that's what he did. Not only was his sense of responsibility questioned, his motives were questioned. You just come down here to watch the battle. You probably told dad something so that he could send you down here. Do you know your motives are going to be questioned? Are you doing this for personal gain? Are you doing this because you want more money? You want more fame? You want more recognition? You just want people to know you? You just want people to see you? Why are you doing this? Your motives will be questioned. And how did David respond to this? He ignored it. Sometimes the best way to respond to your naysayers is to ignore them. Do you know that? You can try to argue with them and convince them that they're wrong, and you would probably be arguing during the time that you're supposed to be fighting. And David understood that. And not only did they question his, his sense of responsibility and his motives, they also questioned the man's character. You're wicked, he told them. I know your heart is wicked. I know you're conceited. You're puffed up. You think you could do something that we can't do? Come on, we're experienced soldiers and here all the time. Why are you asking all these questions? You're too conceited. Do you know your character is going to be called into question sometimes too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Naysayers attack you on every front. So he has been attacked thus far on his sense of responsibility, on his motives, on his character. And as if that wasn't enough, well, let's see what he did with it. He ignored his brother and he kept on doing what God sent him there to do. He kept on asking questions and surveying the situation and seeking to get clarity and understanding so he would know what he needed to do because he suddenly understood that his dad had sent him to bring provision but God had provided him to fight and win this battle. So he realized that he wasn't there to bring provisions, he was God's provision. There you go. We don't have to bring provisions, the provider does that. We are God's provision for this situation if we let him use us. And David understood that. So he kept surveying, and ultimately, because he asked so many questions of so many people, somebody went back to Saul, his king, and told Saul, you know this young man's asking all these questions and talking all this stuff, maybe he's got, he can do something. <laughs> so his king called him. So David's first naysayer was his oldest brother, and his second naysayer was his king. Sometimes the person in authority becomes one of your naysayers, people. What did his king ask him? His king questioned his appearance. David, you're too small, he says. Huh, <laughs> you're not able to go out against this Philistine, young man, and fight with him. You're only a boy. He's been fighting a fighting man from his youth. So he questioned his appearance. He was too small. He was too young. He questioned his ability. He didn't have the skill. He didn't have the experience. What makes you think you can do it? And that's what we get sometimes from our naysayers. They question whether we look good enough, whether we smell good enough, whether we dress well enough, whether we drive the right car. And they also question our ability. Do you have the experience? Do you have the skills? Do you have the education? So David responded to the questions about his sense of responsibility, his motives, and his character by pretty much silence, because he pretty much said to his brother, why are you trying to silence me? And then kind of walked away and talked to the other people. <laughs> and he dealt with his naysayers who were questioning his appearance and his ability by pointing out that it didn't have anything to do with his appearance or ability. It had to do with God's power. 
his response to Saul, when Saul told him he was only a boy and this man's been fighting since his youth, David said to Saul in verse 34, your servant, which is me, David, has been keeping his father's sheep. Yeah. When a lion, so here, here's my experience, I'm a shepherd. I'm not a soldier, I'm a shepherd. And when a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Yeah, who's now? Those people who are defying you those naysayers, when you're seeking to do God's will, are defying the living God. And the same way that you have defeated the other Goliaths in your life, you can defeat these two. And so that is how he responded to the notion of a lack of ability and a lack of skill by saying, I don't need the skill and experience if I got God on my side. Because guess what? He has already prepared me for this. He's taken me through a battle with a bear and a battle with a lion. And I know if he gave me victory with those two animals, I mean, think about it. Do you know what the weapons of a shepherd were? His staff, his rod, and his stones. The stones to throw at robbers, the staff to beat robbers or other animals that are coming along. I mean, the rod to beat and the staff to grip his sheep and bring. That's all he had. So this man had a rod, a staff, and some stones, and he beat a lion and took the sheep out of his mouth. And he beat. God had already prepared. People, whatever it is God's sending you to do, he's already prepared you for. He does not send us on tasks that he has not already prepared us for. Yeah. And I don't care who the naysayer is, it could be your king, as it was David's or your biggest brother, the one who you've looked up to all of your life and respected all of your life and believed in all of your life and who's been your role model all of your life. It could be one of those people. But I'm telling you, man, you stand up and believe what God has told you and do what he's told you. So the next point is that he did. He took the path that God had laid out for him. He first of all declined to use modern, tested, tried strategies. King Saul put his own armor on David. King Saul was said to be a tall man who was above the height of most Israelites. David was a young boy and not too tall, but somehow Saul thought he could put his armor on David. David couldn't walk in it, so he took it off. Sometimes the path to victory is not using what other people have experienced victory from, it's using what God has given you and you have already experienced victory with. David had experienced victory with a sling and his stones. He didn't know how to put on all this stuff and use a gun, it would have been a spear, or a javelin. He didn't know how to use that stuff. So he was not going to use that. He would use the, what other people looked at as archaic strategies. But they were the ones that God had used and given him victory in the past. And so part of taking the path is declining to use the strategies of others and using the strategies of God. <laughs> Second part of taking the path is being confident that the battle is the Lord's. When that young man faced this huge man who said to him, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed, that's Goliath, cursed David by his own gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David confidently 
watched him because David knew it wasn't his own battle, it was the Lord's. David confidently watched him and said, look, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. People, there is still a God in Israel. There is still a God in your life. There is still a God in my life. There is still a God in your husband's life. There is still a God in your wife's life. There is still a God in your son's life. There is still a God in your daughter's life. Let God be God by confidently believing what he has promised. And when you do that, then you act upon his faith. Yeah. David predicted the outcome, and then all that he had to do was like Nike's slogan, just do it. Yeah. He went out there, he swung his sling, the first stone hit the giant in the only part of his body that was not protected. All of this was protected. All of this was protected. His feet were protected. His waist was protected. He needed to see, and so his helmet gave him this much space. And David's one of his five stones, his first stone, hit him right here. And had the effect of a bullet. It went into his head and he dropped dead. And just as David predicted, the man's head was cut off because David cut it off and took it as a trophy. His body was left for the birds of the air to eat like what he has threatened David to happen. And the Israelites then gained the courage to run on down into the valley and beat the rest of the Philistines. I tell you that our adequacy does not depend on the sophistication of the equipment or the quality of the technology we employ or the size of our weapons or the frequency with which somebody else has used this strategy, the statistics and how it's used, how much knowledge you have, how many degrees you have. Our security doesn't depend on a shield. Yeah. It depends on our savior. Our success depends on our willingness to trust God, to have faith in him, to believe his promises, to believe his assurance that he will deliver, to have confidence that he's going to give us the victory. Success in God's mission is guaranteed. Do you believe this? Yeah. I'll say it again. Success in God's mission is guaranteed. Do you believe this? Yeah. The fear of failure crippled the Israelites and the fear of failure continues to cripple us in areas in our lives. But I'm here to tell you today that you will be successful in that mission that God has given you. You need to be able to experience triumph through your trials. But you need to be able to hear God's voice refute the na naysayers, and take the path that God has laid out for you. And I guarantee you, you'll experience God's success. The doors of the church are open. There may be one 